I can't think of any more human activity than conducting science experiments. The game I play is a very interesting one. It's imagination in a tight straitjacket. The beauty of a living thing is not the atoms that go into it, but the way those atoms are put together. What I always think should be the basis of education is not answers, but questions. We should teach kids how to question. So, by the way, these these are our expensive pop filters. I was going to say. Yeah, brand they, new. <laughs> they probably do a great job. Yeah. Actually, they saved us about $27, $30 rather than buying a $30 piece of fabric that we yeah. just hold in front of a mic. We said, hey, let's do it. Um, They're clean, what? right? Sorry? Mm. They're clean. Ah, uh, they've one been... One of them's clean and one of them's dirty. <laughs> I don't know which one. Yeah, <laughs> that's what that is. Uh. Uh, okay. Um, well, how about you start with just introducing who you are and what you do. Okay, so my name is Greg Cohn. I'm a researcher at Western Sydney University, and I study biologically inspired electronics, specifically for trying to do vision in the same way biology does vision. So take the good ideas about how biology sees the world and use that to build better vision systems for robots, for applications, beyond just biology. So we're not looking to be biologically plausible. We're not saying this is how biology works. We just want to take the good ideas from biology and find real-world applications for them. And this is um, neuromorphic engineering, isn't it? Because we had Andre on, who's in your kind of same uh, group here at Western Sydney. Um, do you want to maybe just explain a little bit? Because well, we've already kind of had a mm. podcast on that, but maybe just for people who haven't heard that podcast, mm. uh, exactly what neuromorphic engineering is? Or Sure. So neuromorphic engineering is... It's, it's, oh, no worries. Yeah, go ahead. So neuromorphic engineering, is, it's sort of a quite a broad subject, and the idea really is to take the good ideas from biology and build applications and devices and systems around that. So it's almost like the opposite of biomedical engineering, where you want to take technology and put it in the body. Mm. We're looking at how biology does things and take that out of biology and build electronic systems, mechanical systems, and actual chips, silicon chips, that essentially approach computation and sensing the same way biology does, mm. to try to get some of the efficiencies of biology. And you, if you look at how energy efficient, how space efficient, how uh, just computationally efficient biology is, we're clearly doing it the hard way with conventional approaches like processors and cameras. Yeah. And neuromorphic engineering is about trying to take those ideas and build them into real world applications. So my field is a sort of subset, which is primarily vision, mm -hmm. but we're, we're trying to look more at sensing in general and saying, how do we do sensing in a more biologically inspired way? So, so you mentioned a few advantages that biology has over mm -hmm. Uh, technology and that's efficiency mm. is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, d w why do you think it, it has that advantage? Is what's led? Well, it's a good question, and the answer really is time. Biology has had so much time to refine, and biology only solves the problem it needs to solve as well. In biology, you des systems are designed; they just have to be good enough. They don't have to be perfect, mm. and they get refined based on the environment. So. One of the big advantages biology has over conventional things is robustness. Truth is, we as human beings, we're incredibly robust. Whereas a computer, like a robot, you can build a robot to do a task. But the moment it's presented with something slightly different, mm. slight variation, it falls apart, it falls over and it can't do it. We don't have that problem. And there may be reasons for that. We probably use very quick heuristics that are right 90% of the time. And those operate really quickly. And the the truth is that if they're wrong, it's okay because we'll just correct them the next moment, the next time we have an opportunity to. Uh, one of my favorite examples, uh, as I always use, is uh, I think it was in 1994, mm. Gary Kasparov sat down and played Deep Blue, the chess bank computer. And I think the first set of games he lost, and then they had a rematch and he won. Or I think it was the other way around. He lost first and then he won. But after the game, Kasparov was really, he was kind of a bit of a bad loser. <laughs> and he said, you know, well, I might have lost, but afterwards I can go make a cup of tea and tell a joke. <laughs> <laughs> that. Right. But that's really the point. Yeah. You know, the pinnacle of our engineering at that point could be to human at one specific task. Yeah. 
So, so I guess uh, like electronics and electronic systems have very specific kind of uh, uh, things that they're great at, where biological systems are great at lots of things. And that's probably because they've been built up yeah. in, the, in the real world, so they have to deal with different changing situations all the time. Well, I mean, biology starts, if, as in terms of evolution, it's like going from a car to a bicycle, uh, from a bicycle to a car. But every, you can only change one small thing every single time, and every single version has to be slightly better than the previous one. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily better overall, but better for the circumstance you're in. Mm-hmm. And if you imagine how long that takes, mm-hmm. but how efficient and quick that becomes at defining the best possible solution at each point. Yeah. So it's really like refining the engineering process. So instead of going through that ourselves, why not look at how biology has done it and take those ideas? Yeah. Right. And so how would you design that into technology? Well, I think it... And I think it goes down to looking at the fundamentals. Like take sensing, for example. The way, we, like cameras are my favorite example because it's what I work with every day. Yeah. The way a camera works is fundamentally not the way you want to do tasks. If you think about what the point of a camera is and what it was designed for originally, it's designed to take a representation of a scene or an action and recreate it later to fool your, the human eye, the human vision system, and seeing that again. You, when you look at a photo, you're trying to see what that was a photo of. But that's not how biology sees the world at all. The trick is that our eyes only take from that scene what we need to. We don't see like a pixel perfect representation of the scene. If I show you a picture of a cup, you see a cup. If I show you a picture of a tree, you see the tree. You don't see every single pixel. So your brain is interpreting that image and just drawing the relevant information, which is how biology sees the world. Cameras are designed to take the whole image in the hopes that there's enough there to recreate uh, the image to fool your eye later on. I guess that has implications for how much data and things that they can they have to store as well if they're storing every exactly. pixel. Exactly. Yeah. And redundant data. So, yeah. especially for space imaging, which is what I work at the moment, most of the sky is dark. With a normal camera, you're taking all these pictures of empty sky with no information. But that's still storage space data you have to communicate, transmit, store, and it costs money and power. When, when really we might just be interested in like changes. In fact, I think that's really the secret. Um, it's all about, well, what is the useful information? And something that doesn't change doesn't tell you anything. If you're not seeing any changes, there's nothing to do most of the time. Um, Maybe we can, (laughs) because I've noticed a a thing. um, We've come to your department a few times here, Mm -hmm. and uh, I noticed something that everyone in neuromorphic engineering kind of comes from like really diverse backgrounds. Yeah, you've got people that come from medicine and biology and engineering and and then get into computing and things like Mm -hmm. this. Um, So why don't you tell us a little bit about like how you got interested in science and and how you got to where you are today. Uh, Okay, so I have an unusual story because I found three or four careers that I didn't want to do before I came to science and decided what I wanted and what I really enjoyed, which is research. And Mm. honestly, the nice thing about research is that by its definition, it has to be new and novel. So it doesn't get boring because if you're doing the same thing every day in research, you're doing it wrong. So, I mean, my original degree was electrical engineering. Then I did another degree. I did a master's as well then I did computer science, then I did finance of all things. <laughs> so I, I have a degree in finance and I lasted about three months in finance before I decided it just wasn't for me. So you and finished the degree and started working, you're like, yeah, it's not for me. Well, I actually, so I was working full time as an air conditioning consultant of all things. So I used to do the air conditioning HVAC for large data centers and shopping centers. And I enjoyed maybe 10% of that work, which was the design part. 90% of my job was shouting at contractors, which I'm not very good at. <laughs> and I mean, it was, I had a really good project where I'd come up with this brilliant solution and the company said, we love it, but we just build the building. We don't run the building, so we're not interested. And that was the day my interest in that sort of just died out. And then I switched to finance, thinking that was the right choice. And I really enjoyed it from an academic problem. But the moment people said, "That's I like your idea, let's invest people's money in it. I said, hold on, I don't know if it's going to work. And I'm like, that doesn't really matter. You know, people, we'll just, we'll try. And I said, no, 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 I can't invest people's pensions yeah, in something yeah, I don't yeah. believe in. And then I came to research and... You know, one thing led to another, and it's something I, you know, I really, really enjoy on every, and I, I just come into work, you know, don't tell Andre this, but if he stopped paying me, I'd probably still pitch out. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when you say you got into research, d- did you do like a PhD in, in, in? So my master's, I did a master's by research. Okay. And that was primarily in monitoring of air conditioning systems, so very exciting. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And then my... Uh, for my finance degree, I did quite a big research project on using genetic algorithms to m- do portfolio optimization, which I thought was really interesting. Wait, wait, tell us, tell us about that. So when it's, it's, it's really interesting when it comes to finance, the way they look at a portfolio of stocks 
It's really simplistic, actually. They take the mean of the returns for the last year, and they call that your average expected return. Then they take the variance of that, and they call that the risk. And that's a terrible measure of risk because variance is symmetrical. Mm. So by minimizing the variance, you minimize not just the large losses, but also the large positive gains. Yeah. And no one is averse to having a large positive gain <laughs> right, in your stock return. So you want to look at higher moments of the portfolio, uh, the actual statistics. So you want to have a distribution that's sort of lumped into the positive returns, yeah. so what they call upside variance. So you might want to look at the higher moments of statistics, like uh, you know, there's variance and there's kurtosis and skew, for example. Yeah. But you can go even further than that. So they get very mathematically hairy when you start trying to figure out how to do this analytically. Mm -hmm. But genetic algorithms are a really good way to do it. So the idea was to say, can we use a genetic algorithm to find and optimize higher moments of the statistics for portfolios and then figure out if that will work in the future? Mm. And with historical data, it worked quite well. What, what is a genetic algorithm? So a genetic algorithm, it's kind of a programming technique which draws quite heavily on biology and the idea that uh, you can solve a problem by sort of taking a random guess mm. and then seeing how that performs. So you, have, you need some way to evaluate the, uh, the quality of a solution. So you, as long as you can say, well, this solution does better than that solution, so in terms of finances, which one has a higher average return, for example, mm. and then the algorithm then says, okay, here's five candidates that did quite well, like the best of, let's say, you have 10 possible random solutions. You take the top five and you say, okay, what if I intermix them a little bit? and generate a new population, yeah. just like oh. drawing so it's kind of like evolving a solution. Exactly. Oh. They call them genetic or evolutionary algorithms. And the idea is that you, it's sort of, just like biology, it keeps the good ideas, yeah. and they propagate down, and then it's a way to search a very large space where you can't just brute force it and try every solution. It's a stochastic optimization algorithm. And it's really interesting, and it's a really good way to solve a problem. The problem is that we can't guarantee it's the best solution, mm. which is often the problem. We don't know how good your solution is. We just know it's a better solution than the other ones you've tried. Right, so it's just good enough, maybe, like just similar to evolution, where it works sufficiently, but it may not necessarily Ex be the best solution that's out exactly. there. Exactly. But the problem is that you know, if you want a self-driving car, you need to be able to stand up in corner and say, this was the best solution in this particular situation. Right. You don't want to say it was good enough, <laughs> which is unfortunately what humans do, but humans have this, you know, you know we, we have a sort, of, a sort of randomness to us that you can't have in an autonomous car. So that's why I think we're seeing all these problems. With, you know, it's the same with deep learning, for example, which is all the rage now. So machine learning, deep learning, all these systems are really good at pattern matching and finding inference from data. The problem with them are that we have no idea when they break down. Mm. So it's about reliability. It, if, you know, if I say to you, 99% of the time the plane flies with no problem, mm. it's not going to make you reassure. You know, it's not reassuring when you don't know when it's going to fail. Yeah. Right. So that's the problem with a lot of these systems is that for critical tasks, we don't know when they fail. Right. And as long as you find problems that don't have that problem, yeah. for example, spam email is a great example. It doesn't matter if one or two emails get flagged as spam that aren't spam. You just check your spam folder occasionally. Yeah. Right. But I mean, if you've noticed in the last five years how much less spam you get, yeah. it's simply because machine learning, that's a particularly good application of it. Right. Yeah. So could you maybe, if you put that through, let's say, a, a trillion events that mm -hmm. it can learn from, mm -hmm. can you then make the claim that it's the best one or is it just good enough still then? It's much better than if you only had 100 events and right. much better than if you had 1,000 events. But the problem is that there's what often happens is you want an analytical proof that this is the best solution. So if you do something like at least squares maximization, you're mathematically saying that this is the best solution under this testing metric. Mm. And that's reassuring to people. I think if you look at how SpaceX lands their rockets, they have an algorithm that essentially guarantees as long as the mechanics don't, break down, that, that it will land. It, essentially, the probability of it you know, changes as it increases as it goes down, and the certainty of where it's going to land is refined as it goes along. Their problems have always been that they run out of coolant or the system isn't fast enough to respond, but they can almost prove analytically that their solution is the optimal one. And there's actually a really interesting paper that SpaceX put out on this. Mm. I wish I understood it all, but <laughs> I looked at it. I thought you were going to break it down for us, Greg. I'm like, yes. <laughs> I'm nowhere near smart enough to do that. Maybe we should jump into, so what was the catalyst in, in joining kind of Andre's group here? Uh, so what was that catalyst? What kind of Again, as with all these things, I wish I could say it was what I've always wanted to do and was my plan in life. I wanted, So when I left finance, I decided I wanted to do a PhD. And for some reason I don't fully understand, I wanted to do it in Hong Kong. 
So I flew to Hong Kong and I went to, to universities, knocked on doors, spoke to professors, wrote research proposals, and one guy said, I like what you want to do. And ironically, it was on, it was neuromorphic related by some strange luck of it, but it was on olfaction, trying to build an electronic nose to see if you could use microarrays of gas sensors to detect different types of odors. And, you know, you can train a dog, for example, to detect types of pancreatic cancer with a really high efficiency. So clearly their olfactory system is really refined. So the idea was, can we capture some of that and use that to make diagnoses, for example? So the guy said, yes, absolutely. I'm very excited. Uh, you know, we'll start you in September. And in January that year, he calls me and says, Greg, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is I've got you a scholarship. The bad news is you need to start in three weeks. <laughs> so I'm standing, I was actually in a job interview, oh, and yeah. I got the call and I just said, sorry guys, I need to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Weirdly, I got the job. I think they were very impressed with how, you know, how you with confident that. I was <laughs> yeah. about this. But yeah, he said, you have to be here in three weeks, and I need an answer now. Yeah. So I said, yes. Wow. So I quit my job, sold my car, told everyone I was leaving, told my family I was going. And a week before I was supposed to come to leave for, China, uh, for Hong Kong, uh, the Chinese government rejected my visa. Oh, so I was just left stranded. So I went to my university professor in Cape Town. And I said, listen, John, I tried to go to Hong Kong. Can I just do my PhD here with you? He said, absolutely fine. Come back in April. And then in February, he sends me a message saying, I couldn't tell you then, but I'm actually moving to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> and that was John Tapson who came and started this lab with Andre. Yeah. So I fell into neuromorphic engineering multiple times without realizing it, and it eventually stuck. Wow. Yeah, but cool. What's crazy is that, did you, you, did you know anyone in Hong Kong, or did you just randomly just show up in Hong Kong and say, I'm just going to, like, that's a bold move. I randomly showed up in Hong Kong. <laughs> oh my God. I knew one guy at one university, and that was it, really. But... I just thought, for some reason, I'd been through Hong Kong once before, mm. and I really found it an interesting city. I thought, you know, I grew up in Cape Town. It's a small, it's a big, small town, if yeah. you know what I mean. And it's a bit like Sydney, so mm. it's, uh, you know, it's coastal, it's got mountains, it's really relaxed. So when I went to Hong Kong the first time, I was blown away by the size and the scale. I, I want to live here in the epicenter of everything. So I just gave it a whirl, and, uh, I, you know, I had nothing to lose. And in the, in the end, I think, it's actually, it all worked out really well that I came to Australia, and ironically, I'm working with the people in Hong Kong <laughs> that I would have done my PhD with. So it all comes full circle. Oh, uh, but yeah, it was an interesting, you know, nothing is straightforward sometimes. Sometimes oh, yeah. you just have to go with what's working and what's interesting. Yeah. Cool. Moral of the story, also take risks. <laughs> yeah. And don't worry about, like, things not working out. People have told me multiple times in my life that I'm crazy and I'm making the wrong decision. <laughs> and, you know... Sometimes I you just got to go with that, I guess. Yeah, and sometimes I did make the wrong decision. Yeah. But, you know, I decided a long time ago that, you know, I think you get to set your own metric for success in life. And for some people, that's the size of your paycheck. I think uh, that's, and you know, if that's your metric for success, that's great. Mm. I realized a long time ago that money wasn't my metric for success. And I'll never earn as much money as I did working in finance for those three months. Mm. And I'm okay with that because... At the end of the day, I love coming to work, and I mm. genuinely don't believe they pay me to do what I do. Mm. So, that's interesting. Um, maybe we should maybe we should discuss now we've arrived at <laughs> at Andre's lab mm. here. Maybe we should discuss your work on this uh, camera sensor because we're looking at mm. it here, and we'll put the mm. footage yeah. up during the podcast. Mm. Um, and it's very cool. So I guess tell us about yeah. it. <laughs> so these cameras, they're inspired by how the uh, the photoreceptors in the eye work. So in a conventional camera, you have an array of pixels and you read off all the values like a picture. And you do that at a constant frame rate. So you pull the picture off at a constant interval and that's how you generate essentially a video stream. And for most people that's like, you know, that 24 frames per second that yeah. most people are probably familiar with and heard, yeah. Exactly, and the reason we pick 24 frames per second is after that point your brain fuses the pictures into live motion, into video. Mm. So that, and interestingly enough, for dogs and other animals, it's a much higher frame rate, which is why you know, dogs, dogs now watch TV because they couldn't see all CRT TV ah, sets. But flat, flat screens have a high refresh rate, ah, so they can finally see it. Yeah. So to a dog, an old TV was just a flashing light. Yeah. Ah, to, a, to a dog now, a flat screen is something they can see, which I find fascinating. Yeah, really if I ever get a dog, I'm going to first expose it to the old school TVs. <laughs> <laughs> they will not Freak show out. any interest in that. <laughs> but now you have YouTube channels just for dogs. Yeah. Oh, Dude, that's yeah. crazy. My, my friend's dog has a favorite YouTube channel. <laughs> really? I find incredible. What? Yeah. It's, called, it's called the Senior Dog Gathering Room. It's a bunch of old dogs all sitting around in a room. 
and the dog watches it for hours. So, <laughs> it's like that episode from Simpsons, you know, when the dogs are playing cards. Yeah, <laughs> they're playing poker. That's exactly it. It's, it's exactly like that. And the dog and has its own iPad and it watches TV. So, to go back to the cameras, though, um, these cameras have, the big difference is that each pixel on the camera works independently and asynchronously, much like the photoreceptors in the eye. Mm. So, so you don't have frame rates, you don't have exposure times, times you, don't you don't have motion blur, and you don't have saturation effects. So because each pixel is doing its own thing, and it only reports the changes that it sees. And it's mm. actually the change in log intensity, which means we can see very, very bright and very, very dark parts of the scene at the same time. So I don't know if you've ever taken a photo in a room with a window, and you can either focus on the bright window outside and see what's outside, or you can focus on the room outside and the window turns white. Yeah. This, this is something we've had to learn as we've done video editing, like, <laughs> yeah. and when to set up a shot. And if the, you're exactly right, like if you're setting up a shot, mm -hmm. and there's sorry, right, and there's a real like bright window in the background, mm -hmm. it's it's just going to be white, yeah. and then you'll have the person, or the person's going to be so dark you won't see them, and you'll get some nice yeah. trees outside. Yeah. So, so I mean, to give you a very quick de demonstration of how that works, if I take my torch and I shine it directly into the camera, it just affects the pixels looking directly at it. It doesn't affect oh, the rest. So you can see. Yeah. And that works with windows, it works with everything. And that's because each pixel works independently of each other. And that's actually the, the reason why it works so well for space, because in space, things are either very dark or very bright. There's very few in-betweens. Mm. So you only gain the changes from the relevant parts of the scene. So if I take one of these cameras, or if we just sit still, you'll disappear, because you're not generating any changes. Mm. Yeah. The moment you move, only the pixels affected by the change send yeah, you information. I, before, if I sit really still, I disappear. Yeah. Yeah. And then I start to move around, and like, there I am. Exactly. Yeah, it's yeah, almost like the detail in my shirt, if I kind of like keep it going. And, and like the predator eye from that movie. Exactly. <laughs> but here's the trick to it, right? So you, know, you might think the fact that you can only see motion is a problem. And that, you know, if you think about it, if you're static, only the things that are moving are things that you have to worry about. But if you want to see something that isn't moving, all you've got to do is move the camera. Uh, yeah. And then you see everything, which is what we do with our eyes. Yeah. So when you stare at something, when you fixate on an object, your eyes aren't still. They're not staring directly. They're actually jittering around in little microsecats. And there's a theory, and this is hard to prove, but it's something we were interested in looking into, is that those microsecats may not be entirely random. Your brain might know exactly how your eyes are moving and use that to get more information from the scene while you're staring at it. Interesting. So could you potentially paralyze the muscles of the eye and w with a person... You can't see. If, the, sta if there's, the scene isn't changing and you stop the eye moving, everything just fades out. Wow. And that's the basis for a lot of optical illusions, which is that you can fool the eye by either tricking it into seeing motion by following patterns. So have you ever seen those static images that look like they're moving? I think that's probably because your eye is looking for something in that, and it's moving, and it's interpreting what it's seeing as motion, which isn't necessarily motion. So your whole visual perception of the world is kind of an illusion created by your brain, which is kind of reassuring after a while when you think about it long enough. But the point really is that the way we see the world isn't the way we think we see the world. The, the way you see the world is actually probably more like if you hold your arm at arm's length and look at your thumbnail, that's about the part of the world you see in the resolution that you think you see the world. It's about mm. the size of your fovea. And we're moving that around really quickly and stitching it all together. Mm. And the point really is that things that aren't changing don't have to be updated. Yeah. So as long as you're only responding to things that are changing and updating just that part of the model of your world, that's mm. fine. And that's essentially the underlying principle we're trying to use for these cameras and for the sensing technologies we're building around them. Yeah. So the processing on top of this. Now, without getting too technical, I'm interested because, like, the first questions I'm thinking, if if we're if we're just sticking to space for the moment, mm -hmm. is like, what type of uh, light frequencies can it get? Is it just visual light we're talking, or is it any light frequencies? So, for the moment, they're only sensitive to visible light, and that's just by the design of the sensor. There's no reason why this idea and this technology can't apply to other types of uh, spectrum, so infrared, ultraviolet, mm -hmm. and if you think snakes can see, I think near infrared far better than we can. And it's just about the sensitivity of the photodiodes in the camera. And that can be changed. And that's something we really want to look into, other focal planes. Mm. Uh, for the moment, these are the easier cameras to make. And they're also something that we can visually interpret. So when you look at the images that I'm going to show you on this, this, the screen here, that's actually kind of, um, it's, it's a representation of the data that isn't really fair to the data because we are making frames to show it to you. Mm. And that's throwing away a lot of the timing information that's really present in the data. So when you actually look at the raw data, you wouldn't make a frame and view it like this. It's just the way that we can visually interpret it. Mm. Yeah. So the processing doesn't look like this. The processing works on the raw data. 
which is far more efficient. So the raw data, that would be, I guess, like intensity of the light in each pixel. Well, well it's like, actually yeah. a stream of changes. It's just saying this pixel, the brightness increased. That pixel, the brightness decreased. Oh, so the data coming out of this camera is really simple and straightforward, but it's a continuous stream of events rather than frames at a fixed rate. Mm -hmm. And that's really the power of it. If, you're not look, if nothing is moving, you get no data out. Mm -hmm. The moment something moves, only the pixels that are affected tell you. So you can find the motion in the scene really, really quickly. Yeah. Whereas with a normal camera, you have to search and say, well, compare this frame to the previous one and look for the differences, and that could be the motion, but that could also be noise. These cameras just spit them out for you automatically. So you save power because you don't have to transmit more data, you save power because you don't have to compute more data, mm. and you save power because the pixel and the cameras are doing all the hard work for you. Yeah. Right. Also, I was just going to ask while we're on like kind of technical specs, and also about the temporal resolution. So obviously it's tracking movement. Mm. Um, how fast can it track that movement? Or, or, or the opposite, how, how slow can it go as well? Yeah. <laughs> That's the second question is actually a far more interesting one than the first. The first one is that we use microsecond resolution for the events from the camera. And that's arbitrary. That's just because it's a nice round number. And it's in a proper system, you just process the events as they come out the camera. So you don't need to store time. Time you get for free, which is one of the really interesting things about how these cameras work. And using the sort of spatial temporal way of processing, simply put, you don't have to do anything when you don't get events. And when you get events, you just process them as they arrive. Now, we haven't quite built the computation side and the algorithm side to the point that we can build this into hardware yet. That's always the end goal, but we aren't quite there yet. Hmm. So in the meantime, we can't just process the events as they come. So we have to grab them, and put a little timestamp on them so we know exactly when they happened, and we use microsecond resolution for that. Yeah. We could go faster. There's no limiting factor to that, in fact. Um, so the pixels, sorry. Mm -hmm. So once you stimulate the pixels, mm -hmm. is there like a lag time before they can be re-stimulated? There is a, a refractory period, which is settable on the camera. So we can actually use that to suppress events if we want to, because you, you might not want it to trigger too much. Mm. So the truth is these cameras have a lot of parameters you can tweak. Mm. And by tweaking different parameters, you can make them more or less sensitive. And we can do that dynamically as well. So you might want to say, I, I'm expecting to see something, but I'm not seeing it, so increase the sensitivity a little bit, mm. which is kind of what we do with our eyes. You know, We open and close our pupil to let more light in. Right. Say, well, make it more sensitive, or it's too bright, reduce the amount of light coming in. Right. So we have that opportunity with these cameras to do th that sort of adjustment. And that's also one of the avenues of research we're really excited to start exploring. Mm. Now that we have applications where we can say, hold on, now we know what to expect. Yeah, yeah. Whereas often with these cameras, we didn't know. You know. We were just playing around with them. Having a solid, defined application, I want to track stars or satellites through a telescope, mm. actually makes the research far easier because you have a directed goal. Right. Um, so you answered one of the questions, which mm. was how house. fast, yeah, the flip side of that yeah. is how slow. How yeah. slow. It's, an, it's a problem because slowly changing inputs are harder to detect because you need a threshold of change. And if you change really gradually, you don't see it. Mm. So I don't actually have a sense of how slow it can go, but that's one of the things we should probably start trying to figure out. The truth is that gradually changing stimuli aren't, isn't usually a problem. Mm. So, you know, over the course of the day, the sunlight will get brighter and then dimmer again. But there's a critical point at which it goes from being the point at which you can still distinguish objects to the point you can't. So mm. the, point of, the point at which your visual system... Sorry. Oh, sorry. Is that okay? You know, there's a point at which you stop being able to see properly. And in terms of our eyes, I think that's the point at which you stop being able to see color, and you have to start just seeing black and white mm. light intensity. Which, by the way, your peripheral vision is better than your fovea. So your night vision is better in your periphery than when you focus on something. Yeah. So how slow it can go? Um, probably not really a problem for real-world tasks. But I would say it can probably detect things that happen over multiple seconds. But they don't convey that much information. Right. And if you needed to sense something like that, you might want to actively move. So where I see event-based sensing or neuromorphic vision systems going is what we call active sensing, mm. where you say, actively move the camera to see something. Mm. I don't know what that is. So if I'm looking at something in the distance and I can't make it out, what do you do? You move your head a little bit. Mm. You're actively sensing. You're saying, oh, if I shift a little bit like this, maybe I can see it a bit better. Mm. That's the same paradigm we want to take with these cameras. Mm. And I think that's where the real power lies. Yeah. Should we talk about the utility and yeah, the applications? Yeah, because we've talked about space applications already. Um, 
Uh, but just before uh, you were mentioning some other applications of it. So, so besides just in astronomy and, mm-hmm. and these big changes between light and dark, what are mm-hmm. some other applications that you see? So my my passion really is to find applications for technology because ultimately research is interesting, but unless it's applied, it doesn't really. It's 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 far more useful when you can say this is where it works better. And astronomy is probably the the shining example of where we found a great application for this. But these cameras work very well wherever you have to do a task. So they work, for example, they work really well in um, where you have a manufacturing system, for example, which is high speed, and where you might be in a factory environment where the light intensity changes quite dramatically, where you might have bright lights and reflections. You know, you don't want a a camera that the moment something reflective moves to the field of view, it whites out the vision. We've also used them for drones so you put them on a small micro area vehicle where there's low power requirements so if you have a drone the more power you have to use for transmitting data processing and storing data the less flight time you have so if you can make the vision systems for a drone far more efficient it flies for longer for things like drones as well you need to be fast and these cameras offer an opportunity to do obstacle avoidance at higher speed because you don't have to look for the changes the changes come to you and for drones especially if you start looking at how biology does it I think your vision system is very much tied to the sh- to your aerodynamic structure. Simply put, the faster you can move, the less far you have to see. So you, I've never seen a fly actually bump into something. They hit glass because they can't see it. But you'll never see them smack into the wall. It's because they can move really fast. And the moment they see it, they can avoid it. But they don't have particularly good vision. And I think the problem we have with drones is that we don't match the two very well. And these cameras offer a way to say, well, because we can go faster, we don't have to be as aerodynamically efficient. And because drones are always moving, it's a perfect application, for example. By the way... Should approach DJI. (laughs) Well, well, I used to do quite a lot of drone work. And Mm. the problem with those sort of drones are they're designed to take photographs. So I guess one of the important things about these cameras are that if you want to take nice photographs, buy a camera that's built to take photographs. I mean, for their sensors, they have lots of sensors on the back, backwards and forwards of their drones so they oh, don't they? bump into things. Um, so they've got like infrared sensors so when they're flying backwards, mm-hmm. uh, uh, there's an obstacle in the way, it'll either fly around it or just stop. Really? Yeah. Oh, because, wow. Because they've got lots of... Because that's how people crash them, right? <laughs> You're yeah. looking at the camera going, this is an awesome shot, this is an awesome <laughs> shot. Ah, oh, just like smash my $2,000 drone. drone. Yeah. drone. Yeah. But, but now that a lot of the new drones have like downward mm-hmm. sensors, reverse sensors, and they're using things like infrared okay. uh, and things like this. Um, so these guys have been busy while I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, yeah. So you should yeah. go and um, approach them for a million dollars. That's a brilliant, <laughs> that's a brilliant idea, but why stop yeah. at a million? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, particularly with DJI, yeah. you should hit them up for a lot more than a million dollars. <laughs> probably far, far short. Um, like a million five hundred, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> no, but what is a million dollars? You can buy a crappy, shitty house in, in Sydney with a million I know. dollars. Exactly. Nothing now. No, but they're really yeah. taking yeah. off. Uh, yeah. Literally. You seriously looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wish I did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, the, the thing about drones, for example, is that... It's about what they're doing. So yeah, and exactly. Like obstacle avoidance is a great application for these cameras, but taking pictures down isn't. So you know, you're entirely right. Low power, high speed cameras are exactly the right task for that. So uh, yeah, it's a great idea actually. Maybe drones that deliver stuff. Well, I've always thought Western Sydney is a unique opportunity there because they have all these campuses that are about 40 kilometers away from each other. They should do the mail delivery by drone. Yeah. It'd be a fantastic idea. Should you invent a drone sensor, put a patent on it, and then sell it to DJI? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll have to take this part of the podcast out. And do yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, we, we we have someone from the business development side on the other side of the door, so oh, nice. he's probably got his air pressed the door and writing <laughs> notes. <laughs> like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's cool. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, maybe keep going with that yeah, story because you were mentioning some other applications. So as well. to go, so I mean, there are some really interesting ones, um, a bit more off the wall. Um, I used to do quite a bit of sleep research, and these cameras offer some really interesting applications for monitoring sleep, for example, because. Most cameras ha- are sensitive to near-infrared light as well, and we can't see it. So one of my early experiments that I used to do with these cameras is that you get an infrared lamp and you shine it on the, someone when they're sleeping, for example. It'll light up the room for the camera, but of course you as a person don't get bothered by it. So you can detect motion. Now, if you have like a Fitbit or any of these watches, they detect sleep by what they call restless versus restful sleep. It's basically how much you toss and turn. 
So you could build one of these cameras into a really low-cost, low-power way of monitoring how much you toss and turn in your sleep and use that as a way to measure your quality of someone's sleep mm. without being invasive because, you know, the, they do all these experiments where they put all this equipment on you to measure your sleep, but that itself interferes with the quality of your sleep. Mm. So sleep sensing, for example, is a really interesting application that I was looking at. There was um, one of the other applications we were talking about quite seriously, and I was putting them on satellites because a satellite is very much like a drone. It's a low power, high speed uh, platform where you're really worried about size. So if you can get away with a camera that uses less power, sends less data down to Earth because you know that's really expensive and difficult to do from a satellite, and has capabilities, especially with dynamic range, so where you can see really bright and really dark things at the same time. You can imagine two satellites docking with a bright object like the sun or the Earth behind it. Mm. Some cameras will just you know, overexpose and you can't see anything. This camera, the part that's bright behind it, will overexpose, but the part you're looking at, the part that you're docking with, for example, would still be perfectly exposed for the camera. So there are some really interesting applications in space beyond just looking at space, yeah. for example. Um, I don't know if you want to mention this and we can edit this, mm -hmm. but what about peel, peel, peel? Ah, peel right, so... <laughs> <laughs> so there are some really interesting... Well, it's actually been a question we've had in our community for a long time, which is, how fast are these cameras, and can you see a speeding bullet? Mm -hmm. So last week I went down to a range with some people from the Australian Army, and we tested it out. And the results are really promising. And the applications for that are, you know, it's an interesting and important problem to say, well, if, if you detect a shot, firstly, can you detect if a shot happened, and can you figure out where it's coming from? Mm -hmm. Especially for crowded areas, and, you know, this has become a big problem in America where you know, th they do have these mass shootings, and sometimes there are people in buildings, and you really want to be able to say very quickly, in this area, if there's a shot, how do I find out exactly where it came from as fast as possible? Mm -hmm. and this is a problem for troops as well and for soldiers, and, you know, I'm not particularly interested in m direct military applications, but there are opportunities to make things safer. Mm -hmm. And we went down to the range, and we saw what we could do with it, and it was really interesting to see. Um, and I'm not sure how far we'll take that work, but I, I can show you some videos and I can provide you with a, a, an image of it. And it's, it's spectacular to see because you can actually see the exhaust from the gun as well. That's cool. So we fired rifles and pistols. Well, yeah. they fired and I filmed it. Mm -hmm. And I think they just wanted an opportunity to shoot at an academic. <laughs> 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 they, they enjoyed it. Yeah. So could you actually see the bullet in slow-mo? We haven't. So I only did this on... Thursday, so okay. this is really recent, right. but the, you can definitely see something. Whether we can see, the problem with the bullet is that it's pretty small, and mm. these cameras don't have the greatest spatial resolution, which is something we really want to improve. Mm. So we may not be able to make out the bullet, but we can certainly see its trajectory. Mm. So some, you know, this was a preliminary set of experiments. What we might want to do next is actually put it much closer, you know. I didn't want them shooting a hole in one of my cameras. So yeah. <laughs> I, didn't know, I didn't know how good a shot they were. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, now I know these guys are professionals. They know what they're doing. I'm a little happy to put the camera a bit closer. Uh, um, there's one more application mm -hmm. um, that I'd, I'd like to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. That's space junk. Space junk. So that's actually probably the primary focus of my research, which is to say there's a lot of man-made objects in space orbiting Earth, and they're becoming a really big problem because we've essentially been putting things in space for, for 60 years now, mm. and there's not been very much of an effort to figure out what's up there, where it is, and what to do about it. So we're getting to the point now where when you launch something into space, you have to really worry about it hitting into something else. Mm. Now, space is big, but we've put about 22,000 pieces of space junk that we track actively, and that's pieces that are bigger than five centimeters. Mm -hmm. And everything in orbit is moving really, really fast. Yeah. We're talking hundreds of kilometers per hour. And even a speck of paint at that speed, it's like a bullet. It will make a hole in something if it, if it collides. And occasionally they have to move the International Space Station to avoid hitting into a big piece of space junk. And a few years ago, the Chinese shot out uh, one of their satellites out of the sky with a missile. And that created this cloud of high velocity debris, mm. which in itself is a problem. So when two things collide into space, they release even more space junk that's even more damaging. So there's something, it's something that we really need to do a better job of tracking and figuring out what's up there and also figure out how to actually get rid of the space junk. How do they, sorry to interrupt, how do they track it? At the moment? Yeah. There's a bunch of different ways, primarily with radar. So they have massive radar arrays 
that can detect space junk. The problem with radar is that it's extremely expensive, mm. both in terms of the cost to install one and to run it. We're talking millions and millions of dollars here. Mm. You can do it with optical telescopes, conventional astronomy equipment, which is probably the second most common way to do it. So the US have a network of telescopes that do exactly this. But of course, optical telescopes have a few problems. They can't run during the day, because you can't take pictures of the uh, day through a telescope with a conventional camera. With an event-based sensor, it turns out you can. Uh, they also can't work when it's bad weather, which is why putting them in space and doing it from orbit is far better because you're above the clouds. And they're also, it's all about how long you have the camera fixed and stationary in order to collect enough light to detect changes. Now, we, the way we do with the event-based cameras changes the whole paradigm because we don't have to uh, do these long exposures. We can move the, ca the telescope and image while we're moving. We can also do it during the day, and we can even do it through light cloud. Mm -hmm. So we're whole, our whole idea is to say, well, you know, if you can operate your telescope during the day and night, you double the effectiveness of it because you have 12 more hours of time to process mm -hmm. and to do, to do detections and imaging. And it's a hard task because it turns out rocket science is hard. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but in all, in all fairness, though, <laughs> orbit determination is really complicated because it's there's all these these uh, factors that are hard to measure, like atmospheric drag, so space weather. It's mm -hmm. an issue, and it's dependent on sun activity, which is also something we don't really fully understand yet. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, over Easter, I think it was two days ago, the Chinese space station uh, deorbited, and you know n no one quite knew when it was going to deorbit and where it was going to deorbit. Mm -hmm. And I think they said any, it could hit anywhere between Sydney and New York, which is kind yeah, of a big yeah. chunk of the world. Oh, yeah. And no one quite knew what was going to happen, and no one knew what was on board and how much of it would survive. And part of the reason was, even though we could see it, and it was massive and really bright, it's about the size of a school bus, it was just really hard to figure out how it's going to interact with the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. What happens if a solar panel breaks off? The whole model that we use would be wrong because it would start spinning mm -hmm. and then would encounter more drag in ways we wouldn't have expected. Turns out in this case it seems to have all worked out fine. It deorbited and burnt up somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. But you know, mm. I think Skylab in 1978 broke up over Western Australia and that was much larger than the space station. But pieces of it hit Western Australia. Mm. And it's kind of funny because the Western Australian government fined the US for littering. Yeah. So, <laughs> they, you know, really? they really did, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, these are, these are issues that are going to get worse if we don't do something about them. So part of the reason I'm so excited about what we've been able to do with these event-based cameras and space tracking is that we can do space junk monitoring and tracking and orbit determination in a different way, m far more effectively, far cheaper and faster as well. Mm and perhaps do it from orbit from satellites. So there's a whole range of really, really exciting opportunities we have for space junk tracking and monitoring. Mm. And I believe the Falcon rocket that just launched the other day had some device or some satellite that was specifically for space junk collection. Oh. I wasn't, I actually just saw that this morning and I didn't have time to read it. Right. But you know, we're, go, we're turning the right way, but there's a lot of work and a lot of concerted effort we need to put in to make it mm. safe make space safe for everyone yeah. otherwise I mean if we don't you can just imagine we'd just be trapped on earth yeah and it can happen if enough space junk starts colliding to each other we can form essentially a belt of space junk that we can't get out of without hitting into it I think it's called the Kessler effect where essentially you know one piece of what you know enough space junk accumulates that it becomes like a chain reaction and yeah. everything just starts smashing into each other and just destroys everything in space and truth is, that's our biggest vulnerability. If you want to really seriously affect civilization, and as we know, take our satellites. Mm. War's not yeah, going to be yeah. fought on the ground. It's going to be fought in space. Yeah. You know, imagine if you know, GPS is part of life for everyone now. Mm. And it's based on a bunch of satellites that are up in the orbit. Mm. Take our GPS. Can you imagine how difficult things would be? We're not ready to cope with that. No. Communication, um, GPS, navigation. Um, you know, weather monitoring, all of that. We are so reliant on space, and we kind of have no idea what's going on up there. Yeah, I, I don't want to go back to the days where you'd have to open the book and go to like <laughs> page 115, M17, and goddamn figure out. Yeah. Your, your, those were like you probably had plenty of those days, given your age, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you had to when you had to pull over, roll down the window, and say, how do I get there? Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. You know, maybe it wasn't too bad. We had more human connections. <laughs> it's true. We also got lost a lot more. Yeah, we did. <laughs> um, 
I wait, wanted to talk about uh, before you talk about. Yeah. I just want to ask one question mm. regarding like. So you said radar, this telescope. So mm-hmm. if if they use um, these event based cameras, mm-hmm. they would attach it to a telescope and yes. follow the junk. Yeah. yeah. So that's what we do. We put our cameras on the backs of large telescopes. Well, not so large, but you know, sort of the upper end of what you could have at home, for example. Mm. And we track space junk, and we track uh, stars, planets. And things in orbit around Earth, everything between us and the moon, essentially. What, what could you learn about stars and planets with an event-based camera? So it's interesting because I've been primarily focusing on what's called space situational awareness, which is a nice way of saying everything between us and the moon. So all the man-made stuff in space. Yeah. Mm. But all the work we do applies equally well to astronomy in general because it's just looking further afield. And, for example, uh, there's lots of high-speed uh, changes in space, like nebula, for example. You might want to figure out, you want, might want to be able to image them far faster to figure out what's going on there. You can do what they call occlusion imaging, which is when, when one object passes in front of another object. Mm. So you might have a very dim object in the front and a very bright object behind, which is perfect for these cameras as well. So we're only beginning to look at what the astronomy applications are. So in that case, you'd be able to detect both objects, is that what well, you're saying? Often there will be very small objects that you can't detect unless they pass in front of another object. Oh. Like, plan- like planets orbiting in front of a sun. Exactly. Stars. Yeah. And then, I mean, there are people far, far smarter than me who can figure out all sorts of clever things about, you know, the composition of that, the, the object in front of the other one, for mm-hmm. example, based on how it changes. And you know, in that case, it might just be color, or it might be in wavelength or in spectrum, or something like that. So there's all these interesting applications that I just want some astronomers to sit down with me and go, well, what's, what do you want to do with this? Mm-hmm. So, uh, and for example, looking at, the, uh, there's something called atmospheric uh, turbulence, which is essentially, you know, the Earth is surrounded by an atmosphere that moves, mm-hmm. and that affects images, because it's essentially like looking through water. Mm. And it's a big problem to say, well, if you take an image of the sky, it's often blurry because of how the atmosphere is moving. So, you know, people always ask me, why can't we take a picture of the moon and see where, you know, Apollo 11 landed? And the reason is not because we don't have telescopes. Well, the, you moon. need a huge telescope to do that. I was going to say because the moon landing didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it happened. <laughs> fake news, bro. <laughs> yeah. I think I read somewhere that it would have cost more to fake the moon landing yeah, than to actually land on the moon. <laughs> that sounds and like what the government would be trying to convince people to say, you know, like yeah. it's propaganda. Well, <laughs> so Alfred Hitchcock, they always used to think he f- was the one who directed the fake moon yeah, landing, yeah. but he was a perfectionist, so I think he would have actually preferred to land on the moon <laughs> just to get the shot right. <laughs> so that's my theory yeah. there. But truth is, we have retro reflectors on the moon that were placed there by astronauts. Okay. Yeah. And you, if you have a... Experiment, could it be tracked the moon's uh, getting base close? The distance between no, us and the moon. Further, further away, because further away, away, of the gravity tidal shock. Shooting lasers at it. And if you get a big enough laser, and I don't suggest you try this mm. but you can ref- you know find the retroflector on the moon oh. and shoot a laser and get a reflection of it so mm. i'm pretty sure we're <laughs> on the moon. if not it's a really <laughs> elaborate well-planned hoax yeah. and a lot of people are keeping their mouth shut really well <laughs> yeah. i want to move on because we've, we've been talking for like 47 minutes now time <laughs> flies but um i wanted to talk quickly about because you have a really interesting story. So in biology, we have model organisms, right? Mm-hmm. So we have, um, you know, zebrafish, uh, mm-hmm. C. elegans, which is like a little worm. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have we work on yeast, mice, mice mm-hmm. um, and, and they're model organisms because they've been studied by lots and lots of people, mm-hmm. and we understand them very well, and we test things on mm-hmm. them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is there any such thing uh, that is comparable in engineering? Because I know you did some work on ping pong mm-hmm. to develop this sen- yep. sensor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, but during my PhD, I built a ping pong playing robot based around these cameras. And the idea there was to say, let's pick a task where it's really hard with conventional cameras. And since then, since this was a few years ago now, there have been a few robots that have done it as well with conventional sensors. But the idea was to say, let's pick a high speed task where, you know, if you think about it, if you have a camera that can only see movement and you can move the bat so that you don't see any movement, you're actually tracking the ball. Mm-hmm. Because the moment you see the ball and you move so you don't see it, you're actually moving to intercept it, which might be how we, we do tasks like catch a ball. The fact that humans with our reaction times can catch so effectively is kind of incredible. Mm. I mean, it, it takes a non-troubling amount of time for a signal to go from your brain to the, t- the bottom of your toe. It's like 200 milliseconds mm. sometimes. So how we can do this, we have to be not cheating, but we have to be having some sort of very efficient computation in order to do this effectively. So yeah, because some people can like catch a ball in 0.4 of a second, isn't it? So yeah. like if it's taking 0.2 of a second to get the mm-hmm. signal just to get there, then... Exactly. Yeah. 
So take tennis. I, pro tennis players watch the other player very carefully, and they start essentially planning their stroke based on how the hips of the other player are moving before they've even hit the ball. Mm -hmm. And there was a whole theory that the tennis players grunt to cover the sound of the ball hitting the bat because that's an audio cue. Yeah. So by the way, the most effective way my robot ever won a uh, ping pong was by playing the sound of the ball hitting the table 10 milliseconds before it actually hit the table. <laughs> so it won by cheating, which I think is pretty biological. <laughs> but interestingly enough, there's a whole bunch more factors, so it's not just a visual task. And that was one of the interesting things we learned from this, which is to say, humans are not just using your eyes to do things. Your eyes are part of a much more complicated sensory package that you have. And it's by integrating all those senses, by using sound, by using prediction, for example, by using the idea that you know where your body is and you know the limits of how fast you can move. That's what we're using to play table tennis, for example. Mm -hmm. So these sort of projects are fun and interesting, but you learn a lot from them by saying exactly like that. It's a, we know how well we do at the task. So let's see what we'd have to do with a mechanical system, model in biology, to try to replicate that. Mm -hmm. And the idea has always been from neuromorphic engineering to say, well, if we look at how biology solves the problem, and we try to implement that with our electronics and silicon and mechanics, maybe we can learn what parts of the biology that we don't understand yet has to do to process the data in the same way we do. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of the visual processing system we don't understand yet. Because mm. it seems kind of like uh, innocuous that you would just have something silly like table tennis mm. and, and designing robots to play it, mm. but you learn a lot of lessons out of that. Yeah. And there's another, there's a similar thing that happens um, with the development of AI and robots mm -hmm. with, I think they have robot soccer as yeah. well now. So like people, there's like a, a competition where teams mm -hmm. develop a robot soccer team mm -hmm. and, and it's, yeah, it's kind of a bit of fun. It's an interesting hobby, mm -hmm. but, um, but really you're delving into a lot of deep yeah. questions about how to develop electronic mm. systems. So the, the, the robotic soccer one's an interesting, uh, interesting example because I thought a lot about robotic soccer and I thought the reason I chose a ping pong robot over soccer is that it's a far simpler game. You know, when you have soccer, you have a team, you have cooperation between robots. It's not just the mechanics of the robot itself, which, by the way, is I mean, it's pretty funny if you ever watch them. You know, they will spend five minutes just trying to kick the ball. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the, the problem with robotic soccer is that there's so many challenges there on so many fronts, there's so many levels, from the high-level strategy right down to the mechanics of how you kick the ball. In ping pong, it's much simpler. You hit the ball. And, you know, if you can, f you either want to stop the ball going over your end of the table, and if you can put it somewhere else on the other side of the table, even better. So it actually came out of a project that one of my professors in Zurich which was a robotic goalie, which just blocked balls going into a little goal, and you could throw balls at it, and it would be able to block them fast. This was like the logical extension of that, which is saying, well, can we extend it to three dimensions, which is essentially table tennis. Yeah. Um, beyond the fact that it was big and wieldy and dangerous, which made it a lot more fun, um, it was an interesting learning experience, and I think we're going to recreate that by trying to tackle more, less dangerous problems, like foosball, for example. Yeah, yeah. So next on the lab, we have a prototype system, which is going to be a robotic foosball player where you have a camera pointing down to track the ball and then it'll try to control the opponent for you to play foosball yeah. which is going to be a lot of fun but it's also a way to get people excited and interested in this and we're going to take it with and say to people you develop the algorithms yeah and let's see whose algorithm is the best foosball player yeah um speaking about algorithms and we mm -hmm. kind of spoke about like um deep learning and mm -hmm. ai mm -hmm. uh, i know we spoke with Andre as well about how mm -hmm. AI um, not only beat mm -hmm. like professional chess players, mm -hmm. but Go players as well now. Mm -hmm. um, and what was interesting about this particular AI thing that they had designed was it's, mm -hmm. it was very general where they mm -hmm. didn't have a lot of like special clauses yeah. or whatever that dealt with Go mm -hmm. itself. They just mm -hmm. gave it all this data and they figured mm -hmm. out how to play. Yeah. Um, with these model systems that mm -hmm. uh, you guys are playing with, mm -hmm. is it possible to have like one of those uh, AI systems mm -hmm. that could just learn to do it from the get-go? It's I, I'd like to believe so. The problem is the amount of data you need gets exponentially larger the more complicated the problem is. So like, take the OK Go example. Uh, sorry, OK Go is banned. The AlphaGo example. Alpha which Go, is, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting example of... See, I don't know if that's intelligence. I think that's just really, really good pattern matching. And pattern matching is definitely a part of intelligence. We definitely do pattern matching. Mm -hmm. But intelligence is one level above that. It's like transfer learning. I can teach you blackjack. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to play poker, you can transfer a lot of the knowledge of how cards work from blackjack to poker. That's a very high level process. That's not just simple pattern matching. 
So the difference between the computer that played Go and the opponent it beat was that computer had seen millions and millions and millions of games ago. Mm. It had learned over a huge number, an impossibly large number of games for a human player to play. Its opponent, the person, they'd only played a finite number of games by comparison because there's only so much time. Mm. So the very fact that we even stood a chance against that actually counts more in the favor of the human than the artificial yeah. intelligence system mm. they have there. So when it comes to something real world like processing and understanding the world around us, I think that task is far more complicated than a game with fixed rules because the world doesn't have fixed rules. Mm. And I think the secret to it is all about saying expectation and vision systems with active sensing which say, well, if this is what I think this is and I move left, I would expect it to do this. And if it does what I expect it to do, my model of the world is right and then I know what that is. If it doesn't, I go, hold on, something is weird here, mm. which is kind of what we do. And that whole idea of saying, if my expectation doesn't match with what I'm seeing, if I see something I didn't expect to, or I don't see something I do expect to, then that's something novel and something I have to attend to. That's essentially what the pixels and my cameras are doing. Mm. And that's the sort of idea we want to propagate through the whole processing chain. And that's, I think, the underlying ideas behind where I see neuromorphic vision systems, which is the cameras, and the computation side, which is probably what the rest of our lab do. Mm. That's the direction I see it going in, which is that whole idea of saying, you know, if, not, if everything is going the way you expect to, you don't have to do anything. Your model of the world is right you can relax. The moment something different happens, the moment you see a change, mm. then you have to do something. Right. And that's far more efficient because most of the time you just sit, you sit there and sleep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're right, that's pretty much how we, we, we work as human beings, mm. you know? Yeah. When you're in the new neighborhood, you're freaking out, you're like, where am I <laughs> yeah. going? Actually paying attention. Mm -hmm. And then the drive to Penrith, I think I just realized as I entered the campus, oh shit, I'm here. Yeah. I don't remember anything. <laughs> it's weird, you go into autopilot. Yeah. But the moment you somewhere, a car pulls out, the moment you see a car on the wrong side of the road, yeah, yeah. the moment you see a pedestrian standing in the middle of the street, you go, hold on, I gotta, you, you go from being relaxed and not paying attention to 100% attention straight away because you saw something relevant. Yeah. And that's really the secret. We gather, we collect so much data on everything, but we collect so much noise as well. Yeah. And the real trick is to say, let's get the information from the data rather than just all the data. Yeah. And that's always been the problem. We, you know, more resolution cameras means we capture more information. Mm. We capture more relevant information, but we capture exponentially more noise as well. Mm. So do what biology is and just take only the relevant things out and figure out what that is. And if you have a task, it's much easier to figure out what's important for the task mm. than if you just go, oh, we'll just take everything and hope that there's enough there. Yeah. And that's coming back to bite us because we're storing terabytes of data every day. Mm. I always think about how much useless GoPro footage there is of people, <laughs> you know, skiing badly and cycling slowly and, you know. <laughs> cycling yeah. slowly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who's ever going to watch all of that? No one. Yeah. I mean, it has sentimental value to the person who uses it, for yeah. example. But, you know, that's the problem. There's all this useless data. Yeah. So big data is great, but big data is really trying to find good data out of yeah. big data. Yeah. I think our AI overlords are going to study all that and then figure out what our weaknesses are. I and think that's, 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 that's it. That's it. That's my, it's my constant fear. Is it? Is it They'll figure out that if they just cut off my coffee supply, I'm rendered <laughs> <That's> useless. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I shouldn't probably say that out loud. You can't oh. of course, <laughs> again, dude. This is what happens when you get a Mac. That's where you got to use PC. Oh, it's Sorry, all right. I'm just giving him shit. I think we're well, finished now anyway. Yeah. Um, it's been fascinating. Wait, wait, wait. Before you end it, before you end it, I got to ask you, um, what are your hopes for the future regarding this field and, and just life in general? What, what, do you, what do you hope to? Well, well, I'm excited. I really think we're at the beginning of something big. And it's nice because we've done all of the space work, for example, here in Australia. It's a perfect time because we're about to get an Australian space agency. We have cutting edge research that the whole world is interested in. Mm. I mean, I just went to the US and I presented this and... I'm, in fact, I'm being invited back next week to a conference called Space Symposium in Colorado Springs. I'm going, it's a bit strange, I'm going representing the Air Force Office of Scientific Research for the US <laughs> as an Australian <laughs> showing my Australian research. So the potential is there, and I think we're just going to take it, and you know, as long as I get people excited and interested in this, I think the to make a terrible pun, the sky's the limit. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, okay, one last thing. Yeah. Um, you're a postdoc here at Western mm -hmm. Sydney. Do you have any, are you offering any, uh, sorry, are you taking any research students to do work? Absolutely. So people, we, we're hopefully going to have a whole bunch of positions for postdocs. 
master students and PhD students, mm -hmm. and interns as well, if you're interested and excited. Yep. Honestly, the more people we can get who are interested and excited in this sort of work, and it's a mixture of people who are interested in space and people interested in neuroscience. So it's an, an unusual opportunity to say space and neuroscience. It's, it, it's an attractive idea, and if you guys are interested, let me know. Uh, if you guys can give my email address out, I'm more than happy to. Yeah. I'm really excited. People, come if you're excited and interested and want to do cool things. Cool. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you for the conversation. We had lots of fun and we learned <laughs> a bunch of stuff <laughs> while, I'm, while I'm drawing on Alex. Um, but yeah, thank you again. Great. Anytime. Thanks Cheers. so much, guys. Really appreciate it.